The birth of Venus was made by Sandro Botticelli between 1482 and 1486. It is currently preserved in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. It was painted for the Medici Villa at Castello, the current home of the Accademia della Crusca. Lorenzo di Pierfrancesco de' Medici, cousin of the Magnifico, was one of Sandro Botticelli's greatest patrons. He commissioned him to paint La Primavera and the birth of Venus specifically to decorate this villa on the occasion of his marriage to Semiramide Appiani. Lorenzo, who had been orphaned by his father in 1476 when he was only 13 years old, along with his brother Giovanni had been placed under the tutelage of his cousin Lorenzo the Magnificent, then Lord of Florence. The young man received a highly cultured education at the Academy of Correggi, with such prestigious masters as Marsilio Ficino and Agnolo Poliziano. Semiramide Dapiano d'Aragona, who became his bride when she was 18 and he was 19, in 1482, was the daughter of Jacopo III Appiano, Lord of Piombino, and Battistina Fregoso, half-sister of the beautiful Simonetta Vespucci, who died in 1476 at the age of 23. Semiramide was supposed to marry Giuliano de' Medici, but this marriage did not take place due to Giuliano's untimely death in the Congiura dei Pazzi in 1478, when the nobleman was only 25 years old. Botticelli composed the work for Lorenzo and Semiramide inspired by one of Poliziano's rooms. An inside born in vague and glad acts, a maiden not with human countenance, by lascivious zephyrs impelled and prota, turning over a niche, and it seems that the heaven enjoys it. Poliziano, stands, 99. The figure of Venus is of fundamental importance in Poliziano's stands and, by extension, in Botticelli's work, In fact, the goddess was one of the fundamental symbolic elements of the Neoplatonic philosophy of Marsilio Ficino, who, referring to Plato, distinguished a celestial Venus from an earthly Venus. One is older and has no mother, as she is the daughter of heaven, and is the one we call, Aphrodite, celestial, the other is more recent and is the daughter of Zeus and Dione, and is the one we call pandemic, popular. The Latin Venus derives from the more ancient Greek Aphrodite, whose name is etymologically related to the term aphras, that is, sea froth, since, the myth tells us, its birth was caused by sea froth, the fruit of the seed of the member of Uranus emasculated by Kronos, mixed with seawater. And as he had cut off his genitals with adamant, he cast them from the earth into the very rough sea, and they were carried out to sea, for a long time, around white froth from the immortal member arose, and in it a maiden was born, and first to Cythera divine came, and thence to Cyprus much lapped by the waves. There she landed, the goddess venerable and beautiful, and around the grass, beneath her feet was born, she Aphrodite. The scene shows a naked, demure and beautiful young woman, her hair a golden coppery blonde, standing on a shell valva, being carried by the personification of the wind Zephyrus, who holds a female figure clinging to her, to a grassy beach, where to greet her as a young woman who hands a cloak to the newcomer. Who the figures are is a source of disagreement among scholars. There are those who assert from Poliziano's verses that it is Aura, who clasps Zephyrus to herself, on one side in one of the hours, who hands a cloak to the goddess, on the other. The hours press the arena in white robes, the Aura ripple them, and Crin distended and slow, not one, not different be their faces, as seems to sisters well suited. The hours were three sisters who symbolized the regular flow of time in the alternating events of the seasons. 
In that case, the hour on the beach would be tallow, or spring flowering. Aura whose name, meaning, breeze, had motions as swift as the wind. She lived in the woods devoting herself solely to fighting wild boars and lions, averse to carnal love and seduction. She never had any connection with Zephyrus, but suffered violence from Dionysus. Instead, it is more likely that the icons of Zephyrus with his bride Chlori appear in the scene, on the one hand, and on the other, the same Chlori, transformed into Flora, welcoming the goddess Venus, in analogy with the figures in spring. It must be said, however, that Thallus, a Greek name literally meaning, he who brings flowers, was later called Flora by the Romans. The scene takes place on the grassy coast of Cyprus, where the goddess has just landed carried by a shell. Behind Flora is a flowering grove of orange trees, and on the shores sprout tifae, some of them with broken stems. Zephyr and Chloris, hovering in the air, cause a swarm of roses to flutter, creating a gentle breeze that laps Venus's body and hair and swells the flower-adorned cloak Flora hands her. The mantle is embroidered with icons of daisies, primroses and buttercups. Daisies symbolize youthful innocence, free from guilt, sin, and corruption, as well as matched feeling. The primrose is a symbol of youth. Buttercup represents beauty, and is associated with a somewhat melancholy charm. Flora's white robe is richly decorated with flowers and garlands of roses and cornflowers, the lily emblem of Florence. The very name of the Tuscan city, ancient Florentia, is derived from Flora, alluding to its continuous capacity for regeneration and thus, in short, its eternity. We can thus recognize in Flora covering Venus with a flowery cloak, also a prosopopoeia of Florence, home of the Medici and Botticelli himself. We then see on Flora's neck a laurel wreath and on her waist silks of roses. The presence of laurel refers in turn to Lorenzo the Magnificent who, referring to a passage from Virgil, had chosen the trunk of this plant as his personal emblem, symbolizing eternal life and victory. Roses are a symbol of love and an emblem of Venus. At Flora's feet we see a specimen of Speculum Veneris, a flower that refers to the beauty of the goddess. Behind Flora we see a grove of Melorancy, also known as Mala Medica for their therapeutic properties, alluding to the Medician lineage. The orange trees, blooming with orange blossoms, hint at weddings, emphasizing the reference to the marriage union between Pier Francesco and Semiramide. Their significance is alternated with that of roses, a symbol of love, being among the plants sacred to Venus. The hymn to conjugal love continues through the voice of daisies, a symbol of requited feeling. Interesting is the comparison with the grove of orange trees behind Venus in spring, in which fruit was also glimpsed among the flowers. We almost seem to catch a glimpse of a hint of Venus's still virginal condition at the time of her birth, 
but charged with promises of fruitfulness, which then finds its fulfillment in the figure of Venus, pregnant with life, in spring. The flowers of the birth of Venus, are transformed into the fruitful fruits of spring, in analogy with the young Semiramis, newly arrived in Florence from Piombino to marry Lorenzo di Piergrancesco, with her chaste youth and virginal splendor, before she was transformed into the fruitful Venus of spring, begetting for her husband Lorenzo and the Medici family as many as five children. It should be remembered, however, that in addition to Appiani's dowry, which was 10,000 florins, one of the Medici family's goals with this marriage was control of the iron of the island of Elba, which belonged to the Appiani family. Indeed, the whole scene is laden with flowers but fruits are absent, as the fertilization, promised by the presence of Zephyrus and the Tifei, has not yet occurred. It is also interesting to note that not a single animal appears in the scene, be it a butterfly, a bunny or a small bird. This is the virginal seed of the promises that will be fulfilled in the other paintings of the Botticelli cycle. It is nonetheless a divine place where non-animal species, which represent a rank too low in the supernatural hierarchy of the Ficinian theory that originally created life in the cosmos, have space, if only on a symbolic level. On the shore, below the embracing couple flying over the water's surface, we see specimens of Typha swaying in the gentle breeze brought by Zephyrus. The Typha, or marsh reed, is a clear phallic symbol and implies the coming fertilization to generate fruit and fill the earth with life. Interestingly, some stems appear bent or broken, alluding to the fact that not everyone will have the opportunity to generate in synergy with the goddess of love and fertility. The work is based on the Neoplatonic concept of love as a life-giving energy, as the driving force of nature. According to Ficino's theories, in fact, Love is the foundation of the cosmos since through it creation takes place. Venus is the one called by the Greeks, anadiomene, which from the verb anadiomai means, emerging. The Venus anadiomene was a lost painting by the Greek painter Apelles and also indicates a way of depicting the goddess Aphrodite emerging from the sea as soon as she is born. Her pose also hints at that of the so-called demure Aphrodite who, naked, demurely covers her pubis and breasts with her arms. Praxitel sculpted the famous Aphrodite Snidia who, before plunging into the ritual bath, grasped a cloth and with her left hand hinted at covering herself, and several ancient works remain with us, inspired by her. The coppery blonde mantle of Venus's hair is lightly clasped by a sash that has the symbolic value of binding together, of uniting, and thus alludes to a bond, a bond, including the marriage that awaits the young Semiramis with the Medici family, a bond with the future status of Venus that the beautiful Flora reaffirms by handing her flowery cloak to the naked young woman, cladding her in her new dignity. Some have wished to recognize in Venus's features those of the beautiful Simonetta Vespucci, a relative of Semiramis, who had been dead for at least six years at the time the work was made, but no modern historian supports this interpretation. Venus rests her feet on the shell that holds her in the waves of the sea. 
The conch has been a symbol of fertility and thus of life since ancient times. The term concha in Latin means not only the shell, the mollusk, the oyster and its pearl, but also the female sex organ. In Christianity, the conch takes on meanings of rebirth, resurrection, and spiritual purification and thus is closely linked to baptism understood as the rebirth of the human being in the grace of God and to pilgrimage, understood as a journey of purification. Indeed, there are countless shell-shaped baptismal fonts, and churches are often adorned with such a form. The scene takes place in a setting that contains the four constituent elements of matter, as understood by the ancients, namely water, symbolized by the sea, air, by the breath of Zephyrus, earth, from which flora protrudes to cover the goddess, and fire, represented metaphorically by the flaming coppery blonde hair of Venus. The presence of the four elements, besides alluding to the influence of love and beauty on all creation, is also meant to emphasize the balanced order of all elements that brings harmony to the world. Thus the hot fire of passion creates the propitious ground for decisions inspired by the divine life-giving breath which, meeting the moist fecundity, begets life. Some, like Dr. Davide Lazari, a scholar of medicine and art, have recognized in the particular drapery of the robe, visible above Flora's left arm, the dimple, called the pulmonary hilum, from which bronchi, blood vessels and nerves pass. Such an allusion to the lung parallels that which appears behind Venus's shoulders in spring. In both cases the goddess is understood as anima mundi, that is, the unifying and life-giving principle of the multiplicity of imminent reality. In addition, as in the primavera appear on one side, a livid and, as it were, Venus, Zephyrus, who is contrasted by a sanguine and, arterial, Mercury, opposites who circulate the vital fluid present in the scene, purifying and transforming it through Venus's breath. In this work we again see the Venus blue of Zephyr contrasted with the arterial pink of the cloak held up by Flora. Once again the concealed message refers to the marine microcosm in which the macrocosm is revealed. with its generative capacity that perpetually produces an eternal return, an infinite life cycle. Hence, time is also the protagonist of the work, in which in the light coming from the east, as evidenced by the shadow of the shell, is revealed rose-fingered Aurora who prepares the world for yet another new beginning. For the dawn that by welcoming the sun's rays will flood the whole of nature with brightness and life. The two works, the spring and the birth of Venus, are intimately connected, for in the birth there is the metaphor of the life cycle that starting from transcendence merges into contingency. While in the spring we find the principle of contingency transforming back into transcendence. Venus, transcendent divine perfection, arrives in the contingent dimension and is clothed with it, to vivify it, in birth. In spring, the immanent generative principle is then purified by the breath of Venus anima mundi and the eternal grace of the Charites, 
to ascend, through the action of Mercury, to the transcendent. Hence, as per Neoplatonic indications, humanitas is of not human but divine origin. Beware therefore not to despise it, thinking perhaps that humanitas is of earthly origin. For humanity itself is a nymph of excellent graces born from heaven and more than others loved by the Most High. The flowers that will become fruit. The dawn that will become noon. The Virgin Venus who will become a fruitful mother. All speak of the promise of life and change in this painting. Promises that will be fulfilled in the depiction of spring. According to the Neoplatonic philosophical framework, man is unable to truly know reality and from it trace back to God with the rationality and tools of Aristotelian logic. but can grasp the authentic meaning of existence only through intuitions that establish chains of analogies between things, which are nothing but visible emanations of God. Thus, according to this philosophical theory, the divine meanings of our surroundings are manifold and can only be known by analogy, mental association and through mystical intuitive learning. Therefore, art, in addition to being a mode apt to elevate the human spirit, also takes on a symbolic value, as the artist reveals, through the characters, environments and objects depicted, the transcendent present in imminent reality and, in an obscure, hidden and enigmatic way, shows, through a physical image, a spiritual truth. In synergy with the Neoplatonic vision, with which Botticelli was imbued, Christian and biblical concepts exposed through pagan symbolism are merged in this work, fused in an innovative language that through Olympian images sends symbolic meanings of a moral, philosophical and theological nature, endowed with multiple keys of interpretation. In fact, the visual setting of the work is reminiscent of the sacred episode of the Baptism of Christ. Botticelli thus creates an analogy between the two episodes, the mythological and the evangelical, in synergy with Florentine Neoplatonic philosophy, which saw the goddess of beauty as the intermediary between God and man, in that through beauty God draws humanity to himself. In fact, for Marsilio Ficino, Botticelli's inspirer, love in its different degrees allows human beings to sense the immensity, omnipotence and glory of God through beauty, initially earthly, and then turning them to spiritual beauty. God is the center of everything in all things as present. So beauty, grasped with the higher senses, with mind, sight, hearing, is the manifestation of God. The true lover, therefore, is one who aspires to the splendor of God shining in bodies, and his continual search for a union with beloved person is nothing but his desire to make himself God.